Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. If we'll open our Bibles to the letter of First John, the fourth chapter, from about the 16th verse. The Bible says in First John chapter 4, verses 16, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. We've known it and believed it. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, the 17th verse, that we may have confidence or boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Today, I want to speak about a womb, a particular womb that is defined in the spirit. You know, there are two kinds of wombs. There are physical wombs that animals carry or creation, people carry. And there are spiritual wombs. And we need to understand how the glory and power of wombs work. We know that wombs are cradles of all life and propagation. That anything that we know besides Adam and Eve came out of a womb. And so we know that out of wombs, we see life, and propagation and growth and multiplication of life as we know it. It's the power of wombs. We know that wombs unveil the power of creation and creativity. And even in scriptures we read, we see various examples given by God to tell us what it takes to create things, what it takes to form and mold things. In uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the fifth verse, the Bible says, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, know how the bones do grow, in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. He's showing a wonder, an amazing wonder, and power that is in the womb. So he says, we know not how bones grow in the womb of a woman, but they do grow. That's the power of wombs. If you think about it, how a child's bones grow in the womb, it's an amazing thought. Because it's the realm of creation and creativity. We also understand by scripture that wombs are origins of salvation. The womb is the origin of salvation. In the creation story, when man and woman fall, in Genesis, the third chapter, the 15th verse, God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The scriptures are clear that it is the seed of a woman that will bruise the head of the serpent. There is no mind in question here that wherever this seed was, there should have been a womb. Because it's the only way this seed can come into the world to bruise the head of the serpent. In John the third chapter, and the third verse, Jesus brings the story of the new creation and he talks about the glory of salvation. And in the third chapter, the third verse, Jesus says unto a man called Nicodemus, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so we see the realm of salvation as a sort of womb too because it signifies a birth a sort of birth. And so Nicodemus, in his own kind of understanding, 
he says unto Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Here we see the water and the Spirit as a sort of womb that births us into the realm of salvation. Again, don't forget today I came to talk about the distinctiveness of the womb and its power. Wombs are places of consecration. The gospel tells us in Matthew, the 19th chapter, the 12th verse, he speaks of how some eunuchs are born from their mother's womb. But not only that, we've seen experiences in scripture where God has made vows, Nazirite vows, in the womb of women. You see, he has consecrated people in the wombs of women. Samson was consecrated in his mother's womb. John the Baptist was consecrated in his mother's womb. And all these had Nazirite vows of sort. So we see that there's a lot of work in the womb, even by God. But also it is with the operation of the devil that the devil does many things concerning the wombs. Again, not only physical, but we also talk about the spiritual. In Hosea, he speaks of uh, Ephraim. Uh, the Bible says he begets children to the murderer. And for such, the Bible says they carry miscarriages and breasts that are dry of giving milk. But that's a signification of ministry when you think about it at a bigger scale. And so we see that not only has God intended to do work in the womb, even Satan, the devil, can attack people in the womb. We see a story of a man which was blind, the Bible says, from his mother's womb. From his mother's womb. Some are crippled from their mother's womb. What happens? The devil gets into that womb and does an activity that kills a person, that destroys a person, that frustrates a person's destiny or frustrates their story. But again, it's because he knows, even Satan knows, the power of wombs. So we've seen God consecrate people in wombs. So when we transition to understanding the church in the New Testament story, we see Jesus Christ as the groom, and we see the church as a bride. And this bride, of course, which carries a form of a female representation, carries a womb. The church of Jesus Christ, the ministries that are in us are wombs, and it's from there that we disciple men, it's from there that we empower men, it's from there that we equip men, it's from there that we establish and prepare people for the work of ministry to the edification of the body. So we could speak from a physical perspective of understanding wombs, and then we would transition into the spiritual. When you understand the power and glory of wombs spiritually, you'll understand the full revelation of ministry, because ministry is a womb. Ministry is a womb. It's a world of its own. Wombs are worlds. They're worlds. So the Bible says by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. There has to be a command spiritually for every womb that is formed, either physical or spiritual. Either physical or spiritual. So when we talk about fathering, submission, and all these kinds of things, all of these things is because every womb can only receive life through seed. It can only create life through seed. Jesus Christ was a seed of God the Father. You see? That's why we emphasize things like submission and accountability in the order of church. So, like the physical wombs, again I say, they are also spiritual wombs. It is a humbling experience to think for a moment that God in all his perfection, he had to humble himself and honor the process of this womb. He had to come through a woman a woman, because we cannot really define manifestation without honoring wombs, without understanding how wombs come. So in light of that, when God wanted to come in the flesh, he could have just appeared. Remember, the Spirit of Christ existed. He existed before the world was formed. He existed before he came in the flesh. The Bible says it was the rock from which they drank, that spiritual drink. 
he was the light by night and the cloud by day. But I don't think that the children of Israel were able to discern his person. They were able to discern his person. When Jesus says, there's many things that I want to share with you, but I see that you are not able to take it. God knew what the fallen nature in its most perfect intellect could take. And it was in their ability or inability that God ministered to them. In this instance, Jesus tells them, you see, there's many things I want to share with you. Many, many, many things. But seeing that you're not able to bear them now. So we have to wait for the person of the Holy Spirit to come. We have to wait for the transition of covenant. And then we have a new dispensation where men have to go through a particular womb to prepare them for a certain understanding. To go through the womb of salvation. The preparation that takes place in that womb. That only is the working of God's grace and mercy. That through that we see salvation. And for a moment when you think just how much was available but man was not able to get because of his fallen nature. How much more is available for you because of the new nature that you have in Christ Jesus? We always say if any man be in Christ is a new creation. Behold the oldest person now the new and all things are become of God. All things are become of God. The life of salvation, the womb of salvation begets us into a new realm of life. And in that new realm of life, revelation becomes an invitation. It's not something that you impose yourself into by reason of your rigorous commitments and your fervency of spirit. And yes, fervency is important for the human spirit, but it is not the true war to access the spirit of revelation. Because revelation is a place of invitation. The spirit of revelation invites men and women who have learned by reason of use and exercise of spirit to be prepared and ready. It's the vulnerability of the spirit. It's the vulnerability of the spirit. You learn to be vulnerable. You learn to humble enough because God's voice is as clear as a humility in your life. Now, I'm not talking about the voice that works according to the gift, say if you're a prophet or simply a teacher, but there are things that go beyond that gifting. There are instructions that go beyond that gifting, and these things are only accorded to God's bigger picture of purpose. Not everybody walking this earth, as I believe, understands the higher calling with which we have in Christ. Not everybody understands the responsibility that is present for their hour and what is available for their dispensation. All of us should, because it's given us to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but we have not been taught how to wait on God. Our generation does not know what it means to wait on God. Our generation only knows to go to God when it's disturbed about something. Our generation only knows how to go to God when its marriage is failing, when the children are sick, when they're losing a job. Our generation only knows how to go to God when um, their career is, uh, you know, on a down stall, that's when they say, I think I need to, to seek God. We are talking about a generation that should learn to seek God in spite of all that is happening. That they'll get to a point where out of true hunger and thirst, they can really seek God because they want him. Because they want him. It's that place that takes a man into the true rest, which is of God. That rest which is of the Spirit, because they have believed. The mystery of faith that really leads us to true rest. Without the understanding of the mystery of rest, we'll never rest. Or at least if we think we're resting, we can only rest in the carnal understanding of rest, but not the spiritual. For how can a man rest without the evidence of things not seen? How can a man rest without the substance of things hoped for? And so faith must come to our spirits. That is the place where man has to be spiritually. When we learn to really wait on God, we will be amazed at how much he's ready to invite us to certain places in the spirit realm. And because many are proud to this order of the spirit, they find their own way. And in trying to find their own way, the Bible speaks in the latter times, the spirit speaketh 
expressly that men shall give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And the Bible says, and these people shall speak hypocrisy. In hypocrisy, they shall speak falsehood and deception. I don't think that all of them intend to do that, but it's the gradual process of seared consciences. When the consciences continue getting seared, and a man dies from the true test of revelation and God's person, and there are substitutes in the spirit that that man is able to cling to when they are available, they minister enough forms spiritually to catch the simple into following a certain way. And unfortunately, many assume that that is the way because many of the exposures they had had or they have had from those that have gone ahead of them have also scratched the same angle spiritually. And so even the things that do not become of God's idea concerning revelation, the way of the Spirit and His ministry, they come into the body of Christ and because they are practiced by those that are of reputation, they become tradition, they become doctrine, they become standard practice. And so we go on and on and on. And if a man mentions something that is contrary to the tradition or the doctrine of that hour, they are quick to say, oh no, this fellow is wrong. This fellow is not right. Why? Not because they are really searching out or because they have an eye really that is open to the way of the spirit of revelation, but it is because they have built institutions, empires, egos, names around that which, you know, does not profit, is not as profitable, but has a few glories for which they can exist and show what they would call testimony. And so we don't know what it means to be invited by God into the places where we must hear him and really hear him as he speaks. The heart of God, really, for mankind is to know him. It is eternal life, the Bible says, to know the one true God and his only son, Jesus. That comes primary. That is why I has always said that the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to teach. He says when the Holy Spirit will come, he shall teach you all things. He will lead you into all truths. And the Bible says, and he shall remind you of that which you have forgotten. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus tells his disciples that there is a lot I want to say, but I know that you're not able to bear, be it one day, somebody will be sent to help you bear them, which is the person of the Holy Spirit. Through the womb of salvation, we meet the person of the Holy Spirit. He does not only become relational, but he is sealed with us. The Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit, how he's the seal of guarantee to the day of redemption. So he's in us and with us. He's not just outside the world. He's in us too, the person of the Holy Spirit. And because he's speaking to a new creation, there are things that are already embedded in your nature for your understanding that when he speaks, the ministry of his instruction comes a certain way to you. You ought to know more. You ought to know more. That is the glory of the New Testament. It's the glory of the church in the new birth, like we know it, knowledge. It's the one thing we know better. You as a believer know better than Abraham now. You know better than Abraham knew. Because you are in a better covenant. You know better than Moses knew. But he's our father, it's true. And it's the pleasure of Moses, Abraham, and the rest that we know more. Because the church of Jesus Christ is moving from glory to glory. He says, in the last days, knowledge shall be increased. But we don't see or we're not told how far it shall be increased. And I don't think that it has an end in increase. He has left that vacuum open for every man and woman who is ready to dig and dig. And you can only dig as far as you want to dig, as far as you're hungry to dig, but as long as our hearts are open, God will increase his knowledge in our spirits. He'll continue filling us with understanding. Our spirits can connect to anything. We can walk places in the spirit realm. You see, scientists say that human beings use a very small fraction of the human mind. In that, they seek to imply that the potential of the human mind is not fully exploited and explored. Now, 
Yet, according to scripture, we would understand that that mind could have an end, but the spirit in a man can never. Because the place of the spirit in a man is the very, very foundation of our understanding. So when the world defines understanding, I don't think they really know what they're talking about. Understanding begins from the spirit. When the spirit of a man is awakened, that's where true understanding is. That is why even this gospel, the Bible says it's foolishness. It is foolishness to the world. It is foolishness to the world. But to us, the Bible says, it is the power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah. Now, that said, let's go back to the womb. Because there's something I want to open to your spirit today. The spirit invited me to a conversation about Mary. So I started to study Mary as a case study. Because there are many wombs. And they all carry their distinctions. Okay? If you search scripture and understand how or what it took for the birth of Samuel, you will learn a lot as a reader of the word. If you study the patriarchs and how our mothers, Sarah, Rebecca, they were barren once, and how they received child and the promise that comes with that child and what it takes for a womb that is 90 years old to receive strength, to conceive seed, to bear a child. There is a lot you learn if you are a reader of the word. But today I want to talk about Mary, specifically the mother of Jesus Christ. Because many people do not design the work in that womb. And that is why they come to Jesus Christ <laughs> and they tell him, blessed is the womb that carried you, you know, and the breasts that you sucked. And they say, uh-uh. More blessed is he which readeth the word of God, understands the word of God, and doeth it. All right? Again, if I take us back to the conversation I had concerning Ephraim, why the wombs were miscarrying and the breasts were dry. Because when a person becomes born again, the Bible says, as children uh, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you might grow therein. You know, David says that he learned hope by his mother's breast. So in this instance, when we're talking about wombs, breasts, we're not talking about your physical. We're talking about spiritual. Because there's a spiritual definition of that as well. But let's look at Mary as an individual. Now, if you study uh, the story of Mary, you we all know she was a young virgin who gets a vision from the angel of God that she shall bear a child and she shall name him Jesus. And he shall be the savior of the world. Be it done unto me according to thine will, O God. She submits to the will of God. And conception takes place. She meets a fellow Joseph. And then we all know the process. Those of us who read the Bible. And Jesus Christ is born. Now, Mary, the name. If you study the Hebrew translation for name Mary or Mariam, interestingly, it is translated as bitterness or rebellious. Now, that's a very contradictory name to bear the Lord Jesus rebellious or bitter so I said what am I missing and the spirit reveals to me that the name Mary or Mariam was an old name and actually the Egyptians had that name way earlier and in the Egyptian language Mariam means loved okay so in the Egyptian language when you say Mariam, you're defining one which is loved. When you go in the Jewish culture, when you say Mariam, you're defining one which is bitter and rebellious. And I start to see how things connect for me when I see that when we go back into the spiritual Egypt, not the physical Egypt, the spiritual Egypt, we see that that was a time where the children of Israel were in bondage for more than 400 years under the tyranny and uh, slavery. Of Pharaoh. They built Egyptian houses. They served as slaves to the Egyptians for more than 400 years. We see those wars. And when God sends his prophet Moses to go and deliver the children of Israel from Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land, we see that in the Christian faith as a signification 
of our translation from our slavery life of sin and death into a life of salvation and eternity. So you could also look at the transition of Egypt wilderness into the promised land as a sort of a womb. The wilderness here becomes a womb. The wilderness becomes a womb. So when we're talking about them which tarry longer in the place where women bring forth children, we all know that the children of Israel could have had a shorter journey from the time they crossed the Jordan to the promised land, which should have been a 12, probably 14-day journey. And that journey became a 40-year journey. The Bible says because in seeing the Philistines, they would faint for fear and find their way back to Egypt. And so it's the many things that define the spirit of delay. If you're a reader of the word, you will understand what I mean by the spirit of delay. There are many people in the world who are doing so little in so long a time. And on the same face of the earth, there are people who are doing so much in a short period of time. Your destiny is supposed to be marked by doing much in a short time because you have the person of the Holy Spirit, the Redeemer, the primary Redeemer of time. And time is only redeemed in the realm of revelation. If things are not revealed, if you're not invited into the spaces of revelation, you'll never understand what it means to really redeem time. Even in the world, it's the ideas of men that quicken them. It's the ideas of innovations and inventions that quicken men. It's the ideas of region and logic that quicken them. It's that. The sort of illumination invites men to the quickening in life. And so it is with the spirit realm. So we see Moses bring the children of Israel. The wilderness becomes a womb. Okay? And so... If you're to think of Egypt, the spiritual Egypt, not the physical, the spiritual Egypt, biblically as a place of our bondage, of our slavery to sin and all that, we see that when Mariam or Mary goes into the space of sin and slavery, they go and their name does love. And I want you to understand that. So we see uh, by God's deliberate mind that in the place of slavery and sin, there is a naming there's a proclamation, there's an identity that is proclaiming love on them. And when that Mary shifts and comes in the Jewish culture, in the Jewish setting as we know it, where she is called rebellious and bitter, it's in there that God begets love. It's in there that God begets love. And who is love? God. And then he chose in a place where bitterness and rebellion is, and then he put a life of signification for love. In fact, the Hebrew definition for the word womb is compassion or love. Mercy, compassion, or love. They all represent womb. So in the place of our most fallen nature and slavery, we are called and named love. And in the place where the devil names us bitterness and rebellion, God forms love in us. Hallelujah, glory to God. God creates love in us. So the womb as a realm of compassion is surrounding the life which is of love. And that is in the person of Jesus Christ. No wonder she had to be called Mary. This is the life that carried Jesus Christ. The outward was rebellious. The outward was bitter. The outward was fallen. The inward was full of love and it was love in its own. So, when I say in 1 John that we know and now believe the love of God, the one which he has for us, for God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. And the 17th verse says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. He's trying to say that when we connect to God's idea and understanding of why the main theme both in our days of slavery, for the Bible says, for a while we were yet seen as Christ died. The Bible says he loved us before we loved him. That's the essence of Egypt. That in our most fallen slavery nature of sin, Mary, the carrier of the womb, later of love, Mary would mean love. He would name love in the place where men are fallen, where men are sinful, and where the devil changes that name and calls us sinful and rebellious, it is the time he gets within that individual and creates love, the room of love, the realm of love. And this is the expression of Jesus. So 
when we talk about Jesus as the express image of the invisible God, when Jesus comes in the world, we see love perfect. We see love perfect. We see the theme of love sustaining us in the realm from our fallen nature. God loved you even before you knew that he loved you. Even before you wanted to know. Even when you still hated him, he loves you. And then he gives you that transition. And when that identity gets on you as one which is rebellious, he gets inside you and starts to create a form of love. Because it's the only way he can become God to you. So when we talk about preaching the gospel of grace, we're not just talking about righteousness imputed by faith, forgiveness of sins. It's more than that. It is a life that invites us to the realm of love that is not only steadfast, but is unconditional, that is long-suffering, that in every sphere, God will create its provisional story to exist in every realm because it's the only way he can exist in the life of men. So when we're talking about God is love, he does not just love you. He is love. And he says, and they that do not love, do not know God. How I wish we believers understand this, that it's not how many prophecies we speak. It's not how much revelation we split. It's not how many lame will walk and blind will see. It's not how many dumb will speak and dead will be raised. But it's in the revelation of love that actually God is truly perfected in us. That is the completion that puts us before any nature and manner of judgment that we know that we shall pass it. For he says, for he that does not love knoweth not God. Knoweth not God. Knoweth not God. From the beginning of humanity, when man fell, what was the first thing God did? He clothed them. It was an expression of love. We've seen man falling and falling, and man is going to continue falling. For the Bible says, for all have sinned, present continuous, and come short or fall short of the glory of God. The Lord is be inefficiencies in our flesh. The Lord is be inabilities in our flesh. But the most perfecting factor is the revelation of God's love. Love becomes a womb. So we're talking about all kinds of wombs. The most deliberate womb in the spirit is the womb of love. It's where everything is begotten in God. It's where everything is begotten. For God so loved, the Bible says, the world, that he gave his only begotten son. That he gave his only begotten son. Why? Because he loved. Why did I begin by saying I want to talk about the womb? It's because I wanted to emphasize the realm of love as a womb. I wanted to emphasize the womb in defining love. And why again, like I said, in the Jewish culture, it's compassion, it is love, it means mercy, it's the same word. That means everything that authors anything, that creates anything, that consecrates anything, that baths anything, that sanctifies anything, that separates anything, the, the beginning of anything that will bring life is in the realm of love. If a man has not learned how to connect to the realm of love, it doesn't matter what they do. They will never have a full completion in the things that must be made or created. Recently, I was teaching about the power to occupy. But allow me to add that our true occupation is birthed in the realm and womb of love. The Bible says whatsoever you do, the Bible says you do in the love of God. You do it by the leading of the love of God. Why are you a minister of the gospel? Are you a minister of the gospel because when you were raised in church, they noticed that you had a good voice and consequently they advised you to join choir and then you joined choir and started singing and you had a nice voice and before you know that, because it was fun and all your friends were in the choir and so you became a musician or, yeah, that's a musician, not a worshiper because they worship God, uh, worship him in spirit and in truth. Did you get into your place of worship because you have a good voice or you got into your place of worship because you have the revelation of love, God's love for you? Are you a preacher because you are raised around preachers and you were a very hardworking fellow in church and the pastor identified you and said, I think you should lead service. And before you know that, you became a preacher and, you know, things fell well for you because you knew how to teach. But did you have the revelation of God? as love. 
when you say you're going to get married? Do you enter marriage because you feel you're old? You've hit the third or fourth floor. So women these days call it. So you say, I think I need to settle down. But do you have the revelation of God's love in marriage? Are you ready to carry that responsibility of God's love in marriage? When you go into career, do you go into that career in the revelation of love? When you build whatever you build, do you build it in the revelation of love? I wish you know how deep this is because God is only as God where love is. And he emphasizes it every day to us that he that does not love knoweth not God. They do not know God. He that is not connected to agape, the love which is of God himself, that man does not know God. So when you say, oh, they that know their God will be strong and they shall do mighty exploits, what does it mean? The realm of that grace for us to do mighty exploits, for us to walk in the strength of the Spirit, all becomes clear when we understand the womb of love. So love becomes a womb. Or the womb becomes love. Everything must be done in the love of a father. And the reason why many people today are struggling in ministry is because in their primary years of understanding God, they were not revealed the way of love. They were not revealed the way of love. They were not taught what it means to fall in love with God. They were not taught what it means to be alone with God. They were taught duty and routine. This is how you pray. So they go to pray because of how they saw other people pray. They are lust for things even without knowing that they are lusting for them. And that is why my heart is so heavy for the younger generation because our younger generation cannot pray a certain way. They cannot sustain prayer. It becomes the heaviest burden on their lives. Why? Because the Lord has taken the place of God without us knowing. So in the book of Revelation, he speaks to the church and he tells them, for you have forgotten your first love. Some people think it means the first way you felt when you received Jesus Christ. No, that's not the first love. In fact, the literal translation there in the book of Revelation, your first love is the person of Jesus Christ. Because it's our first love. When was the last time you really sat in true fellowship with God and sat in a presence so thick that you didn't want anyone to bring you out? When was the last time you really felt the presence of God to a degree where you didn't want anyone to bring you out? Anyone to call you out? To a place where you could not look at your phone, you could not look at your television, you could not look at your computer because something has invited you into a realm that catches every attention of yours and maims every other part that is kind of to you. And all you have in your spirit is just behold God in his perfect form as love. When was the last time you felt that? And if you have, are they just moments of your life? Are they just few days on a calendar which happened today and then take another spell of four or five months and then again you feel the presence of God and then sometimes you go to church and they lead worship and you feel the praise of God. Or sometimes you put on a nice song and feel the praise of God. And some of us are in that kind of perpetual life where we're in and out. We're connected and disconnected. We are feeling it today. We're not feeling it today. I'm feeling it. Today. You understand? And some of us are like that. You cannot live a stably upward life with that kind of lifestyle. You need a continuous life of a love relationship with God that is uninterrupted, cannot be intercepted by deliberate design and commitment, you'd be willing to do away with anything that separates you from that flow. When that flow becomes consistent, when you start to face the world, what I've seen with it, when you start to face the world, everything becomes an expression of God's love. You heal the sick because you love. The Bible says in Jesus, being moved with compassion to the womb of love, okay? The Bible says he healed their sick. So he's not healing their sick because he just wants to show, oh, you see, I'm a son of God and I have power to heal the sick. Heal, no. The Bible says being moved with compassion. Again, like I said, compassion means womb. Being moved by a certain womb. And what was that womb? The womb of love. The Bible says he healed. He says when that love is perfected in you, 
The Bible says, as he is, so are you. You start to live the very life Jesus Christ, uh uh, I'm not going to say lived. No, you start to live the very life Jesus Christ would live if he was in 2020. Because the Christ, after the death and resurrection, is an exalted one. The one before the death and resurrection was not an exalted one, yet he had signs, miracles, and wonders. So when he saw that time for you, he says, uh uh, greater things shall you do because I go to the Father. Why? Because the person of the Holy Spirit is going to come and the covenant is going to change. That's why the Bible didn't say, for as he was, so are you, or will you be? No, the Bible says, as he is. In which glory is the person of Jesus Christ presently? That is where, by this womb, the church has been invited. There is a confidence, there is a boldness that comes to you when you are perfected in the understanding of that love. And when it comes to you, and you look at a blind eye, you don't worry, it will open. You look at a deaf ear, you don't worry, it will open. You look at a cancer, you don't worry, it will open. A young man a couple of uh, months ago, should have been two or three months, had gone to visit a, a ministry person who had given birth. And so a young man calls me and he says, I've been diagnosed with the worst form of cancer. And the wounds had eaten him up and, you know, he was all septic. And they said, oh, you know, but to extend your life, we might have to maybe give an operation. Maybe that would add a few days, a few months for you. And so the young man calls me. And I was in the car. And then I felt this thing rising up in me telling me that with the love that I have for this man, I have to heal him. I could feel that love in my spirit. And out of that, I remember I was driving and I said, can we pray together? And uh, we prayed together. And after praying together, the young man... Of course, it takes about three or four weeks. I don't hear from him. He calls me after four or five weeks. Then he says, Apostle Grace, every cancerous wound on me died that day. And they started to dry and dry. And within a month, I did not have anything on me. My skin was as good as new. So I asked him, did you use medication? Did you go for the operation? What happened? He said, from that prayer, I made up my mind. I was even not going to go back to any doctor to operate me or touch my body because I believed that God heals. See, what people see is the power that gets cancer out of this man's body. What I see is the love of God that is so powerful. And like Corinthians 13 verses 8 says, it never fails. It never fails. So you learn to cling on that love. Yes, you got a bad doctor's report. But you're God's child. You're the beloved of God. I've already seen myself as, you know, God's beloved little boy. I feel he's my father. I know that he loves me. Even when I mess up, I look up to him and I see him looking at me and he's laughing and he's like, hmm. I just feel it. It's that love relationship that gives us our confidence, that assurance in our spirits that in spite of what you go through, all will be okay. Praise God, hallelujah. All will be okay in the mighty name of Jesus. So yes, too, we've been diagnosed with things and then you believe God and the voice tells you, but I love you. For me, the most affirming experiences of any test that I've ever gone through in my spiritual walk has been hearing God tell me, I love you understanding the love of God. There's a power it comes with. There's a boldness it gives my spirit. And I'm like, uh-uh. Uh-uh. My biological mother loves me. My biological father loves me so much that they would do anything for me. Yet man at his best expression of love can never love me the way God has loved me. So if a mother would nurse a child from sickness to health, how much more God when he touches that body full of viruses? What would he do to you? But you see, many of us are not awakened to that love. We take that as a very light thing because sometimes in the expression of that love, we have many ideas about it and sadly those ideas are worldly and finite in nature because the language that speaks these things is a fallen language. Let's talk about love from its most perfect sense spoken by the most pure language. And it says that love, agape, Corinthians 13 verses 8, 
It never fails. But he says, but whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. He's saying this goes beyond what we can ever prophesy. I mean, God sends a prophetic word to a man and tells him, Ezekiah, put your house in order, you're going. And this man turns to God. And that same love, that same womb gives him a new life. Fifteen more years. Fifteen more years. Praise God, hallelujah. Fifteen more years. And while the prophet was walking, the Lord tells him, go back and tell the man that I've given you fifty. He, while he's getting to the middle court, he tells him, go back. God changes his mind and word over a man's prayer because that's the only way to this man love will be expressed. That's the opportunity for him to live a full life. Hallelujah, glory to God. When you understand this thing, you will not be sick again. What does that mean? This is what exactly I mean. God has provided for us in Scripture every word that tells us that we should not be sick again. By His stripes, we were healed. Hello? It doesn't matter what you have taught yourselves over the years or the doctrines of devils that have been taught in the church of Jesus Christ. It is possible to live in divine health and live a full life without any sickness. But it cannot happen when you're not awakened to that love. It's possible to have divine provision until the day you die. But you cannot when you're not awakened to that love. It's possible to have a successful marriage, raise godly children. But it's not possible when you're not awakened to that love. To know that the love God has toward you. He wants that for you more than you want it for yourself. And that in the midst of that love is the power that is able to withstand any attack of the enemy. That speaks otherwise. That speaks otherwise. It is possible for you to have a successful ministry. I cannot tell you how many times we have had challenges in the ministry. And while I'm praying, all that can recuperate me, resuscitate me, give me life, is to remember that he loves me. But he loves us. Oh, he loves us. And once you continue having that understanding the perfection of that love the glory of that womb of love you start to see that the things that seem so complicated start becoming so easy so easy so easy god in love has intended to edify us even in our most simplest level of understanding that's why love should be preached at its most simplest way the Bible says knowledge puffs up, but love seeketh edification. You know what it means? It means that God would rather deal with the deepest realms of revelation and invite you to a love that edifies because he knows it's the beginning of that love for your edification. It's more important for God to edify you than to amuse you with revelation. Because that's the beginning. And so even as ministers, if we must preach that which we call depth, it has to begin from the love that edifies. If in the end we don't seek the edification, then we're seeking the praises of men. And we have all men lost. Most of all lost. Because we lose the picture of why knowledge comes to us. Knowledge comes to us. Because in the eyes and realm of love, we might edify men. Learn to yield to that love. Learn to connect to that love. Learn to relate to the love of God. There's somebody... The things that you have gone through, you have even asked yourself, does God love me? He does. But God wants you to go beyond, he loves me because the Bible says so. But that you'll get to a point where you'll experience that love. And when that love overflows your spirit, nobody will tell you to create time for God. You will find that you have time for him. But every time is time for God. Some of us are believing God for a glory. For whose price of love we are not willing to lean into. It's not how much we love him. It's how much we receive of his love. That is why when Jesus was on the cross. And he was going to go to glory. He turns to the disciple. He loved. And it's to whom he bequeathes Mary. His mother. He says, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. The one which was named rebellious 
and bitter in the Hebrew is the very one that carries a womb, love, and in there begets love. And that the fulfillment of the assignment on the love at the cross, the one which is bitter, named bitter and rebellious, is committed under the care of the one whom the Bible says Jesus loved most. Love is the beginning of our lives, it's the middle of it, and it's the end of our story. What I give you are simply pictures, allegories, things to help you connect to that inner scene. That love is all. It's all. Love is the ultimate womb of all wombs. And without it, we cannot define any womb. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to pray with you. And this is my heart's prayer for you as I pray with you that you will be perfected in love. That you will be perfected in love. I'm not just talking about the feeling that you love somebody or you love something. No. Beyond that, that you'll understand God as love. And out of that understanding, out of you, certain things will start to form. Whatever you see in your life, because love is a womb, you will see life coming out of you. Because love is a womb, you'll see consecrations in you and coming out of you. Because love is a womb, you'll see expressions of power coming out of you and working in you. Because love is a womb, you'll see yourself multiply, propagate. You'll see yourself grow, increase, and multiply. You'll see yourself go through the hardest things. There's somebody listening and you have an incurable disease. The doctors say it's incurable. As you lean to that love tonight, you're going to go to the same doctors and they're going to find that that disease has left your body. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now wherever you are, raise your voice and start to pray. Thank God for his love. Receive his love. Connect to the womb of love. Understand his love. Relate with his love. Lean into his love. Receive it. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Oriko Salabaye. Great is your man. See toward me your loving kindness toward me your tender mercies I see day after day for You always provide for me. Come on, receive it. Receive it. Masa braka telebo zeleba. Kosi lebo yeleba. Great is your mercy. Rosa remonde rebo salabaya katelepo. Shire ke zile mando robo satalabaya laba. Robo shila manda raba kasata. Zonde rika salaba koya raba zolobo. Rimando shila baya laba kose. Robo sita laba yeleba. Lean into the love that heals you. Lean into the love that delivers you. Lean into the love that comforts you. Lean into the womb that changes things, that begets new things, that upholds things, that sustains things, that undergirds things, that cradles things, that delivers things. Because God loves you, all things are possible. Because God loves you, things are changing for you. Whatever you fear to happen, will not happen in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You are undergirded in a womb of love, in a God who loves you, and that your life is from Him. Come on, 
Rima zile keshite le mayanda. O salamaye. Father, we thank you. We thank you. Like all wombs carry life from the carrier, your life is given by God. He sustains you and he will hold you to the day of your full maturation into your next level of life, your next level of glory, your next level of breakthrough. And because you know God loves you, expect only good. I believe that you're going to have a good week. I believe that you're going to have a good month. I believe that you're going to have a good year. I believe that this season is good for you. I believe that the next decade is good for you. It is good for your family. It is good for your finances. It is good for your health. It is good for your career. It's good for your marriage. It's good for your children in spite what the devil says. It's good for your ministry. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you. And all saints said, Amen. Wherever you are and you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's a very simple prayer. But this is an invitation, an open hand invitation for you to receive his love. God is saying, uh-uh, I don't care how you love me. I care that you relate and react and receive my love. Receive my love. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. And all you have to do is to say these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest. Thank you.